Good morning, everyone. Alaikum salam. I'd like to welcome uh, our members who joined our webinar today. And uh, first, I'd like to welcome our moderator, Daniel, and uh, our speakers today, Ala and uh, Kristen. Uh, I've seen the PowerPoint, and it's an interesting subject to be discussed today with our members. And I know that we'll have a bunch of questions, and they will be here ready to answer all the questions. Uh, I hope that everyone is uh, well and uh, be safe. We'll join the meeting now. Uh, Daniel? Thank you, Khalid. And um, welcome to the, to the speakers, Allah Dalgan and, and Christian Baer. It's a pleasure to, to join you both on this uh, joint webinar today. And um, welcome to everyone on the line. Um, just to echo what Khalid was saying there, if anyone does have any questions, please add them to the chat and we'll get them to, uh, to the questions at the end of the, the session today. Um, so some brief introductions. My name is Daniel Norman. I'm the Regional Director at the ISF coming out of London today. Um, and we're joined by Alar Dalgan, who is a Managing Director at Cognic DX, um, and Kristen Baer, who is the Managing Director out of a G2K Group. Both speakers have a wealth of knowledge in, uh, in the space of security and cyber. And we are going to be spending about 25 minutes each on both of their presentations today. Uh, the first speaker, Alad Dalgan, will be speaking about security in the age of data analytics. And I've seen some of the slides as well. And it really does touch on quite a, a range of, uh, of topics, a range of different technologies from, from IoT through to, to 5G. And, and big data analytics, which is a, a really good segue into Kristen's presentation, which looks at a, uh, a more progressive approach uh, using AI um, in, in many different use cases and across many different industries. So it's my pleasure to be here and uh, to join this webinar. And without further ado, I'd like to pass over to Ala. So Ala, over to you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, allow me to thank uh, CIRA, SPA, and Security Middle East for organizing this uh, educational event. Um, my name is uh, Ala, and uh, I'm a fan of uh, smart technologies and smart cities. And uh, I hope by the end of this uh, short webinar, uh, I'll be able to pass some of my excitements about Smart City uh, to you guys. Um, today, we're going to cover uh, security, but from a very new and interesting angle, which is we're going to take a look at the most uh, exciting emerging technologies in a Smart City today and how they intersect with uh, security whether it's physical security or surveillance or cybersecurity. So what are these emerging technologies uh, that are the key enablers of smart cities? You have the internet of things, you have AI and machine learning, you have 5G where we could also add advanced wireless such as Wi-Fi 6 and 7. You have big data and analytics, you have blockchain and you have security. Yeah, today we're gonna cover uh, four of these items and how they intersect with security and they enrich it and they enable it. Let's start with IoT. So if you Google uh, Internet of Things, you will get billions of uh, results and billions of definitions. But my favorite definition is that Internet of Things is the third stage of the Internet. Uh, in the early 90s, we had uh, the internet of computers, because it was a bunch of computers connected together. In the early 2000s, we started adding not just computers, but phones and tablets and iPads and iPods. So the internet moved from stage one, internet of PCs, to stage two, which is internet of smart devices. And then around 2009, 2010, we started saying, so why stick to smart devices? What if we start connecting non-smart devices? What if we start connecting uh, street lights 
and irrigation systems and generators and pumps and buildings and trucks and trees. So when, when we started doing this, the internet moved from stage two, which is the internet of smart devices to stage three, which is internet of non-smart devices or for sure internet of things. Now, how does IoT and security play together? There are two angles to look at this question. The first angle is looking at how IoT helps with security surveillance. And the second angle looks to the uh, cybersecurity of things connected to the internet themselves, okay? The first angle, when, when we're talking about uh, collecting a lot of video footage around a city, around a facility or around a gated community, uh, or could be around some critical machinery. On one hand, you're connecting, you're collecting video footage from your cameras, but you would enrich your analytics a lot if you are also collecting sensor information. Take, for example, if you're doing uh, some asset tracking in your warehouse and adding this uh, automatic inventory tracking uh, via the sensors to your video cameras that are monitoring uh, the warehouses. You could do the same for trucks moving big cargoes across uh, countries. Uh, you can do the same for critical machines, for example, power substations uh, that, are, that have security cameras to ensure security. Um, the operator can uh, capture both the camera footage for security reasons, but also the sensors of the door lock or the motion sensors. And combining video data with sensor data you get a much better uh, analytics and a much better security. So this is the first angle, how IoT sensor can enrich video surveillance. Let's look at the second angle, the security of IoT itself. When IoT first started, the focus was as always on connectivity. So new protocols and new connectivity uh, mechanisms were invented from uh, uh, LoRa to NB-IoT and uh, LTE CAT-M. Um, but then a little focus was uh, put on securing these things. The main challenges here was that you cannot embed a big, heavy encryption uh, protocol in uh, battery-based small CPU devices. That was the main challenge. But since around five years ago, which is almost half the lifetime of IoT, we started to see a, a renewed focus on securing IoT devices. So now, if you're interested in the world of cybersecurity, uh, in the past, you had IT security and OT security. Now there's an entire discipline that's being born, which is IoT security itself, whether on the hardware chip level or on the software level. And that's the first emerging technology, IoT. Let's move to the second one, which is 5G. So 5G uh, rests on three pillars and uh, aims to achieve three applications. EMBB, URLLC, and MMTC, yeah? EMBB stands for Enhanced Mobile Broadband. This is increasing the pipe and the throughput. URLLC stands for Ultra Reliable Low Latency Communication. This is, stands for applications that requires millisecond or less uh, speed of communication and, and latency talk about remote surgery or about robotics. MMTC is massive machine type communication, and this is the IoT component of 5G. But today, to talk about video surveillance and security, we're gonna focus on EMBB. EMBB, which is uh, Enhanced Mobile Broadband, allows uh, video surveillance and security applications that were not possible before 5G. And I'll give you a couple of examples. In 2015, uh, many uh, clients uh, tried to have uh, video cameras 
uh, to monitor their facilities, but they did not have a fiber to the field. So they had to use 4G routers. One of these uh, people that, that used this is, for example, the telecom operator, uh, Do, who wanted to monitor uh, the, the intrusion to their uh, power, to their uh, power stations and uh, cellular stations. Uh, the problem is when you had a 4G uh, cellular router, you were able to connect two cameras with a medium um, quality or three cameras maximum. Beyond that, uh, the LTE pipe was not able to uh, pass video data in, in, in real time. Now with 5G and especially with EMDB starting from release 15, we have started to see this, this problem uh, being solved because now you can attach at least four cameras, sometimes six or eight cameras to an industrial 5G router in the field and have a solid pipe to transmit your video surveillance in real time back to your command and control center. Same problem used to happen when uh, we are asked to deploy cameras and surveillance on the move, for example, on police cars. And you know that every year, whether in Saudi, in Qatar, or in UAE, you have RFPs coming to the market asking for multiple cameras on police cars or on buses. During the LTE days, this used to be solved either by limiting the number of cameras connected to the LTE router or increasing the number of cameras but limiting the resolution of the camera to low resolutions. Or uh, sacrificing the continuous transmission and only recording and transmitting during events. Now with 5G EMBB, the problem is solved and you can do multiple cameras on a moving bus, multiple cameras on a moving police car without sacrificing resolution and without intermittent transmission. Another big application of 5G EMBB plus security surveillance is drones. Because now you can control drones uh, via 5G connection. You can ensure low latency because of the URLLC, but also you can get a, a high resolution camera transmission using 5G EMBB. Now, I would be remiss if we mentioned 5G, but we don't mention one of the key player in the uh, broadband uh, market, uh, whether it's a competitor to 5G or whether it's a complementary solution, the jury is still out. Uh, Wi-Fi has uh, grown beyond, beyond the Wi-Fi AC that everybody knows and loves. And now we're talking about Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 6E and Wi-Fi 7. With this late three new generations of Wi-Fi, we are able to use a frequency that is less prone to interference like the old generations. I'm talking namely about the six gigahertz, but mainly we're able to do a much bigger throughput than the Wi-Fi that you know and love. Wi-Fi 6 goes a little bit lower than 10 gigabit per second, Wi-Fi 7 promises up to 40 gigabit per second. So again, like 5G gives you a bigger pipe for your cameras, so you can transmit video surveillance in high resolution, Wi-Fi 6, 6E and 7 will also be a key player in the wireless network infrastructure of video surveillance in case you don't want to go long distance or across the city uh, you would use Wi-Fi 6 or 7. If you want to go long distance, you resort to 5G and And that's 5G intersecting with security. Now let's talk about edge computing. Um, I, uh, I see the market keeps alternating between uh, cloud, edge, cloud. First, everything was uh, distributed. Then in the early 2000s, there was the big cloud revolution. Let's take everything from the edge and put all intelligence, all computing on the cloud. And now 
since 2015, we're seeing the opposite push, which is, hey, we don't have to put all the intelligence at the cloud. Let's push some of the intelligence back to the edge. And that's what edge computing refers to. Let's take some uh, good examples that are practical examples. Let's take, for example, uh, video analytics at the edge. Okay, so uh, you're all familiar with the application of doing number plate recognition uh, at the entrance of a parking. Yeah, but that, that's the boring application because the car is moving inside the parking at a speed of zero kilometers per hour. Okay. When it, where it becomes interesting is when the car is moving at 120 kilometers per hour. How do you do ANPR and analytics then? Okay, so uh, Abu Dhabi is experimenting with some POCs with multiple vendors uh, with this. And on Sheikh Zayed Road, they are uh, deploying some, uh, some rugged uh, industrial computers that have a video analytics and ANPR capability on the uh, industrial PC itself. They install it next to the radar, and now they're able to capture ANPR, the, the number plate of cars moving at 120 kilometers per hour uh, on six lanes, and then do a quick analytics uh, at the edge, whether it's a seat belt, uh, whether it's speed, whether it's car registration, um, a lot of this analytics can be done at the edge. Obviously, uh, you still need the cloud and connectivity to the cloud. 5G can help in this regard. But let's up the ante and now talk about uh, an application where the analytics engine is on the move and the target of the video is on the move. So in, uh, uh, in security uh, conferences, uh, Dubai police uh, has been showcasing for the past uh, two years an application where you have a smart light bar uh, uh, that is installed on the uh, top of a police car, equipped with 12 cameras, and also equipped with a, an industrial PC with six core or eight core with a video analytics engine on it. So now, not only the target is on the move, also the analytics engine is on the move and is doing a lot of this analytics, 70-80% um, of it without resorting back to the cloud. And when it does need to go back to the cloud, it can do so easily via 5G connection. So we covered uh, IoT and security, we've covered 5G Wi-Fi and security, and we've covered edge computing and security. What about big data? We hear a lot about big data, uh, but big data is not only important for banks and for telecom operators and for government, it's also super important for the security industry. And that's because the security footage storage is growing exponentially or almost exponentially. According to Springer, it has breached uh, 42 zettabytes back in 2021, and we're talking here not about all the videos, the fun videos on YouTube or social media, we're talking strictly about the security videos. When you have zettabytes of storage of video data uh, to, to, uh, to store or to uh, sift through or to analyze or to make sense out of, your old systems, your old databases don't, don't work anymore. You need new systems and this was the revolution of the big data over the past decade we started to see new tools based on non-relational databases that are able to store a huge amount of data structured and unstructured and mind you video is a very unstructured data but also to uh, uh, to warehouse it to to clean it and to uh, analyze it uh, some of these tools are Apache uh, Kafka, uh, Hadoop, uh, Spark, Cassandra, and, and many more uh, for those who are interested to, to learn more about it. So if you're storing your big data uh, and you want to make sense out of it, especially surveillance data, there are five stages. 
in a big data life cycle. First, you acquire, so data acquisition, data engineering, data warehousing, data serving, and data analytics. Let's go through them one by one. First, uh, data acquisition. So using MQTT uh, broker or publish subscribe uh, mechanisms, you can uh, input and capture a lot of data uh, from multiple sources. Uh, and then you can feed it to the data engineering uh, processes because uh, you need to take this raw data and you need to clean it and cleanse it and curate it. You need to tag it and label it and secure it. And you need to establish clear pipeline to the data warehouse. The third step is the data warehouse. This is where you form a single source of truth of data that is clean and cleansed and tagged and labeled and curated and uh, ready for uh, analytics and reporting and serving. And then step four is data serving. This is where you apply uh, reporting and intelligent uh, uh, report uh, to make decisions out of your data. And then the holy grail of the data life cycle, which is intelligent analytics. So here you have three stages of analytics uh, on the data. You can apply uh, analytics on the past data, hist historical analytics, uh, analytics on the real time data that is coming to you from the cameras and associate IoT sensors. This is streaming analytics. And the holy grail of analytics, of course, is and future, which is predictive analytics. And for that, you need AI and machine learning. So let's talk about AI and machine learning and their applications in uh, security. So uh, here are a few examples from all around the world. Uh, Nippon in uh, Japan, uh, is being equipped, the Nippon Expressway is being equipped by Fujitsu with an AI-based uh, engine for deep traffic pattern analytics. The same system is being, or similar system, I've seen it being implemented in Taipei City Center in Taiwan by A-Value. And the idea here is a, a cameras capturing traffic at all time of the day, sending it back to analytics engine in the cloud, of the traffic control center, and then predicting traffic patterns uh, for the future week, future month, uh, regular holidays, and then diverting the traffic using digital signage accordingly to minimize traffic and commute time. There's another company he based here in, in Dubai, very um, innovative company called Dirk. And these guys, they are using AI for V2X communication. So uh, what they're trying to do is they're trying to apply predictive analytics from capturing footage of pedestrians approaching a crossing. And then if they detect that this pedestrian is looking at his phone, is not paying attention while approaching the crossing, they will send an immediate notification to a small screen or small device uh, installed on cars, in cars, but obviously not all cars, only the car that is approaching that particular intersection uh, as the pedestrian is looking at his phone. But my favorite example of uh, cameras and AI has to be Tesla. Um, and I always, you'll always find me uh, arguing with my friends about Tesla, uh, especially my friends who are in the financial market, they think that Tesla is uh, overvalued and their conclusion is based on the fact that, hey, look at uh, Toyota, that's another car company. Look at GM, that's another car company. They produce 100 times more than Tesla and they are less valued. So Tesla must be overvalued. And I always counter by saying Tesla is not a car company. Tesla is an AI company. And once you see that, then the comparison with the traditional car manufacturers doesn't make sense. Let's, let's look at how Tesla uses AI. So they have a large uh, supercomputer, 
uh, in their um, headquarter equipped with one of the most cutting edge AI software. And this is called Dojo. I like the name Dojo because it's a word play. Dojo is the Japanese um, place or gym where uh, you go and learn karate and, and mixed martial arts or any types of martial arts. Uh, so you, you're there to train in a dojo. And uh, what Tesla means by the word dojo here is this is a software to train our AI. So if you look at a Tesla car, a Model 3, it has at least eight cameras plus some 12 uh, sensors, LIDARs, et cetera, et cetera. And these cameras are capturing footage um, every day, every second of driving and sending them back to the uh, Tesla Dojo for analytics. So they're capturing different roads, uh, different markings on the roads, different signage, different uh, driver uh, behavior, different pedestrian behaviors in different cities. And imagine uh, half a million Tesla cars or a million Tesla cars all equipped with this, all learning about different roads in different weather in different countries with different curves and different signage and different people crossing and sending all this data back to the dojo system where the system learns more and more and becomes smarter and smarter. And then when a new Tesla car is born, it gets equipped with the latest AI version and the most knowledgeable AI version. So the Tesla car hits the road equipped already with all the wisdom and the intelligence of its previous 1 million predecessor. And this is why uh, uh, Tesla is not a car company, it's, 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 um, it's an AI company. Um, I would like to uh, finish by uh, talking about one interesting uh, trend that we're seeing. Uh, I told you before that uh, the debate is always oscillating between should we put analytics at the edge, should we put analytics in the cloud, should it be a combination. Currently, one of the most cutting edge uh, applications is to uh, keep alternating between edge and cloud. So on one hand, you, uh, you, you take your AI engine and you uh, train it in the cloud because in the cloud you have man, much more data than you would ever have uh, or you could ever store at the edge. So in the cloud, you train your AI model and then you deploy it to the edge and let it run a lot of analytics and intelligence at the edge without coming back to the cloud. But then every now and then, you take it back to the cloud for retraining or enhanced training or evolved training and you redeploy it back to the edge. So it's a continuous learning, continuous development for your AI. And that's my 25 minutes. Uh, I would like to uh, thank you for your attention. And if I would leave you only with one message, it would be this one. It's not about collecting data, whether it's video data or whether it's sensor data, it's about what you do with this data. Okay, thank you, Allah. That was a really informative presentation there. I've been scribbling down a lot of questions for the end of the uh, end of the session here. I think we've got a lot of really interesting themes that we can explore. Um, one of those themes is, is AI and uh, machine learning and, and, and different uh, descriptions of what that might be. Um, but I'd, I'd really like to introduce uh, Kristen, um, who's going to be walking through some of those key topics there. Um, and then at the end, in about 25 to 30 minutes time, we can jump back in and cover some of the, uh, the, the hot topics and questions then. So um, Kristen, if, uh, if you could share your screen and Allah, if you could uh, stop sharing yours. Okay, good morning. Um, thank you very much to uh, the, the host, the SPA and CIRA and Security Middle East Magazine for having us uh, in today. Um, I'm excited to, to build on what Allah said and talk about how you take siloed data to secure AI-driven platforms. So continuing with the car theme today, 
When you think about a BMW, you don't think about the engine block. You don't think about the chassis. You don't think about, you know, the, the components and the brake light. You think about the ultimate driving machine. That's what they want you to think about. That is their platform. And a platform is orchestrates every single component of that car to achieve the highest performance and best customer experience they can. It's not dependent on any one of those specific technologies that I mentioned before, and it can evolve and is future proof. So in this example, I show you a picture of the ultimate driving machine, it's a car. They also have electric vehicles that are marketed the same way uh, as they evolved and became future proof. And they also have uh, motorcycles that are that way. So it's the concept of the ultimate driving machine hits the right consumer at the right time to help them think about the opportunities and platforms. Platforms focus on client needs and their medium to establish a competitive edge. Again, BMW didn't have to resell us on electric vehicles. We already know that their platform is the ultimate driving machine. And as the, uh, the world evolves to more electronic vehicles, they're already positioned to take care of that and don't have to resell us. We know it's a BMW, we know it will still be good. So how do uh, AI platforms tend to work? So we think of them as the breeding ground for driving business models. They're unique to the customer, they're permanent and they're not exchangeable again. What I mean by this is, as Allah said, as things evolve from edge to cloud and back again, or we go from IoT sensors to the rolling Dubai police cars. When there's a new use case for that client, a true platform allows the client to plug that in and doesn't force them to spend the money to scrap and then take out an existing platform. If you think about siloed platforms, things like um, just pure access control, those have become gone from being innovated to being a commodity. As Allah said, you have to have the data needs to progress through to use cases. There's a saturated market for individual use cases and individual platforms, VMS, BMS, things of that nature. And we're seeing the landscape become increasingly fragmented. The clients are demanding a future-proof solution that allows them to continue to evolve as they need. And that's what an AI platform, a true AI platform does for them. So how do we do these types of things? So first of all, you take everything that any input that the client thinks is germane to their situation. So IOT, you know, the typical stuff, cameras, traffic lights, the drones, the bars on the police cars, um, sound, anything, temperature, whatever the client thinks that they're getting that they want from a sensor, as well as all their third party systems. So CRM, social media, control data, uh, whatever they have, we take that in through a unified gateway we homogenize and organize the data, and now we're ready to add value. So this is differs from if you have all those systems siloed. So for example, if you have an access control camera uh, poised at your gate and it says uh, blacklist, whitelist, well, somebody comes up to the gate, unless there is a brain behind that that says, okay, I'm going to connect that through, I'm going to tie it to the gate, and I'm going to open the gate, it's worthless to you. So what a true platform does is creates an ivory tower situation where you can self-detect and self-set up the IoT devices and the data sources to accomplish your needs as they change. Is there a special event today? Are you hosting guests like this in person? What do you need to do to make sure that whatever that ecosystem is, that it's running smoothly? So when you think about algorithms all by themselves, they're like super cool. We all agree on this one. But they're, uh, they're, they're very robotic. So they're looking for the data that's coming in. They're told specifically what to look for and then produce a specific output. They don't have synapses like our brain. So they don't make the connection and say, I should think about this more. They are limited in scope and fit for very uh, specific and combined tasks. And they're lacking that logic. AI brings the brains in there. It's the synapses that makes these things connect together so that when you see a security situation, for example, in a stadium where you see uh, crowd control, you start to see people behaving weirdly, then, instead, then before an event happens, you're able to think this through, push information out to security guards, to gates, to digital signage, to think like a human does, but billion times faster to take action and put people where they need to be. 
So you understand immediately whatever situation you're monitoring, but equally importantly, you're gathering data for correlation for the future. So if, for example, uh, in the mention I just did of uh, you know some sort of fight breaking out in a stadium, you're tracking data of who these people are so they don't get back in your stadium. You know Things like what was the weather, what teams were playing, do they have a history of this, what's looking on social media so you can prepare better to have better security or um, avoid these situations in the future. Again, self-learning, self-setup is important. And equally important is self-improvement over time by the platform so the operators are not dependent on someone coming back in and tweaking it for them. They take care of it themselves because it's their brain. So once we end up pushing in the algorithms, the third party um, information, the IOT, and we're providing the capability for the client to act on what they want to do, then as I mentioned, you can understand an immediate situation, see correlations for the future and visualize that and push this information exactly to who needs to see it. So is it a security guard in a stadium? Is it a traffic person in, um, at an intersection? If you're running an entertainment complex, is it a lifeguard to say, hey, your pool is overcrowded and we need to send more lifeguards? What do you need to do in a push-pull situation? So first you push that data out to the end user you know, on a mobile device and let them see in real time what's going on in their span of control or their span of responsibility. But equally importantly, you allow them to send data back into the brain. As Ala A said, it can go from the cloud to the edge to back again, whatever needs to be pushed um, back and forth so that the brain can continue to learn and you can take bigger, better, faster, and smarter actions. So use cases are what becomes important once you have the platform. Once the brain is there, just like our brain, when you learn about a new thing, so like Ala A mentioned that the Dubai police have the bars on top and they're using those um, you know, on the police cars now, that's a new use case. And instead of them having to come in and say, we're going to buy an entirely new system, if you have a true AI platform, they go to the platform and say, we want this. And it effortlessly plugs in. A true platform can take, as I mentioned, things from the IoT, the third party, the algorithms and API, whatever information the client wants, and then you can do things like say, once you have these bars on there, what other use cases can you build? And you plug in new use cases. So the platform becomes the ultimate operating system for the client, allows them to plug and play and drag intuitive interfaces into connecting the data and takes that commoditized data, such as who's at the front door, how many people are in my mall, how many people are in my hotel, and allows them to make revenue producing business decisions alongside their table stake security situations. And a true platform is highly scalable in size within the client. So you can have you know, one use case at one location, take that same use case. So think of something like um, time tracking, access control and parking lot uh, attendance for workers at a factory. You can have that on an endless number of workers, parking spaces and, and you know, time sheets, and then take that to endlessly and effortlessly to as many factories as you want, and then layer more and more use cases. So a true AI platform doesn't run out of space. It runs out of imagination. So you can add as many use cases in as many geographies anywhere you can and monitor them all in real time. So let's talk about how a little bit how this works in the real world. So think, start with any community and a community could be uh, an office building. It could be a small mall. It could be a park. It doesn't matter what it is, but you can start looking at different use cases like who's in there, visitor management. Do I wanna have payment systems, um, pro uh, property management. So if you see things that indicate that a sprinkler system is, misbehaving and that's going to create, you know, not just a, uh, a water situation, but a safety situation because people could fall. You could have digital identities. So you think you can think anything is a community, whether it's one office building or a cluster of office buildings or a neighborhood or a campus or a mall. But then like take that farther, like we need to, we're talking about security today. So who's in this place? Like plug in the license plates event inspection by drones, add 3D mapping. You can add things like 3D mapping with um, 
helicopter based uh, cameras that you can show in real time what crowd are doing. Are people loitering in an area? What's up with the parking lots? Um, if you have a critical site, which we very commonly do here in our neighborhood, uh, make sure that there's extra security around there. Plug in your smart city surveillance, such as traffic cameras, perimeter protection, and make sure that you're doing behavioral analytics on all of this to make sure that your, that your community, whether again, it is one building or an entire city, are running securely and tie those in to the resources um, on the ground, in the air, and uh, in the buildings to make sure that you're keeping everybody safe. Once they're safe, people need to get around. So you can tie in things such as buses, trains, you can optimize routes based on weather. So, hey, we need more buses on rainy days. We need more uh, trains on days when we're having events. How many people come into each station? What time do they come? Um, is it time to, um, to maintain these trains or vehicles? Digital signage, if you're going to change routes on people and crowd detection and heat mapping so that you can see are people moving in the most efficient and safest way throughout a transportation ecosystem down to things like if people leave a bag behind, which is always a big deal, unattended bag is always a, you know, a huge deal, but equally importantly, tie that unattended bag to whoever left it and, and uh, benchmark it against blacklist, whitelist. So if you can see you just have a clueless person, which it typically is, or a dangerous person, which you have been watching, and tie that into capacity management. So how do you move the people around safely in your community? And then in most of these communities, what if there's an event? What if there is some sort of uh, sporting or entertainment event? We talked a little bit about crowd control, but again, heat mapping um, and the public transportation management, when are they coming? Where are they going? What does the line look like? Do I need to open more gates? Do I have a capacity control? Uh, are there too many people trying to park here versus the tickets, which would be weird. Who are these people? Why are they coming? Uh, lost children. Um, integration with the ticketing system. If you have a, you know, a highly secure event that you want to make sure that the people entering match the people that bought the, the tickets. And then again, um, you know, things like violent smoke detection to make sure that your event runs smoothly as you want and that you can communicate on a true platform back to the people with a community app for that event or that building, which you can do, you can guide them if anything changes to um, be a mobile app and participation and loyalty programs so that you can merge in the retail with the fan experience with the safety at the same time. And then I mentioned retail a little bit, every one of these ecosystems is interested in revenue. So, you know, whether you have one little store inside uh, one office building that we started at the beginning of our community to an entire giant mall, you know, we, we think a lot about security in terms of dangerous people or dangerous situations, but we also need to look at security on stuff like capacity control inside malls. Do they use carts? Where do the carts end up going? Does somebody slip and fall? Are the temperatures inside the refrigerators at the right uh, at the right temperature to keep the food safe? How long has that food been laying around to make sure that you don't make people sick inside this? And these are just small examples of uh, you know of security use cases inside a mall. We're not here to talk today about revenue, but a true platform ends up taking all of these security situations that we talked about and is not limited just to security. We're seeing, particularly in this part of the world, that they do the use cases that I just mentioned and then lay on extreme retail. So how do I tie in my loyalty program? If I'm living in a smart city, how do I tie in a community app so people can book restaurant reservations, pre-register their guests that are coming in, None of us like to sign up for nine or 10 apps. And we're seeing the trend come back in where people say, if I'm in this community and I trust you, I wanna run everything off my phone from security where I saw something weird. I saw, I saw a, a strange guy. I saw something uh, going on that I think is dangerous. Um, and I can report that in, but down to, I wanna book the tennis court. I wanna book my restaurant reservation and the communities, ecosystems, retail establishments are very interested in knowing inside this, how do I monetize the ecosystem? And we're finding that in the real life, real tested, that they're offsetting the cost of these platforms by the revenue analysis they're getting on the other side. So when you think about a true AI platform, 
Think about being bound by your imagination and the ability to talk to the platform. As long as there's connectivity, whether it's on site, you know, on prem, in the cloud, on edge, or a combination, you can endlessly scale these things. So uh, that's it for me today, Daniel. I'm really excited to talk about this and um, really excited for the questions. Thank you so much, Kristen. I think there's a lot to unpack here um, yeah. from both presentations, really. And uh, I think we've got about, I think we can take it to about half an hour to um, to go with uh, with some of these questions here. But um, welcome back, Allah. And um, I think what I'll, where I'll start really is because we're we're talking to a kind of a Middle Eastern audience. I'd like to ask. Um, I'll start with Allah. Um, why why do you think the Middle East is so progressive when it comes to technology development and adoption more so than than Europe or maybe the States? Um, so yeah, what, what do you think? Competitiveness. Um, I think uh, they have uh, realized uh, 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, maybe more, that uh, the future of economy is not going to be digging carbon out of the ground and selling it on ships to Europe and America. And uh, the alternative to old economy is new economy. And there is no newer economy than the digital economy. And uh, the leadership in this part of the world has understood this and, uh, and knows that uh, the next oil is data and the next oil is talent. And that's why they are uh, focusing their entire economic strategy on uh, technologies such as data and, and AI and, and, and IoT and all of the emerging technologies, but more importantly, on talent. They, are, they want to attract talent, uh, they want to grow local talent, and they want to be uh, ready uh, to compete in the neo economy of the 21st century. Okay, thank you. And and do you have any additional thoughts there, Christian, on um, on why the Middle East is so progressive? Yeah, I think so. I'm approaching two years since I moved from America, and I think that one of the um, the benefits to this part of the world is you know you have a flat organizational structure. You're not going through in the U.S. 50 states worth of towns elections, getting up to you know, everybody thinking, am I going to get reelected in two years or not? And, and, and leading by, you know, poll, which right now it's, it's kind of tough back at my home of uh, the messes we're having because there's, you know, everybody's politically fighting. You don't have that in this part of the world. What you have in this part of the world is consistency of leadership, which allows you to make long-term decisions and you have the ability to make financial decisions on how you're going to fund these without worried about like, is it going to tax my people more? Are they going to think this is a good idea? And you have this unparalleled vision. You know, this part of the world has learned and looked. And as Allah said, data is the new oil. And they said, what do we have and that we can push out to, to, to pivot, to make our platform more aggressive and not dependent on carbon? What do we have that we can do to help people? How do we welcome more of the world to, you know, these are tiny countries, like they're, they're state size to me, but how do we attract people here that will allow us to turbocharge our vision and get this done faster than you could in Europe or in the United States and have commitment, both a visionary commitment and monetary commitment to we're going to get it done and you know, when push comes to shove, if you don't like it, you don't have to live here. So everybody that lives in this neighborhood, those of us that are the expats, we bought into the vision and we said, we want to be here and we want to contribute and we are okay with it. So that is going to propel you know, this part, this, this is the new Renaissance over here, which is why I think we're all here. Okay, interesting. Um, I'm probably coming at this from a, a more challenging, perhaps skeptical, perspective of um of the, the the kind of broad spectrum of technology that the amount of data we're collecting and as i was listening to pro both presentations it reminded me of the uh the uh, george orwell book 1984 where where there's constant surveillance and we're sort of monetizing data and things like that and what what do you what do you think in that kind of space are we are we getting to the point where 
it is we're just constantly monitoring individuals are we are we just monetizing the citizens data or is it genuinely for safety security and for the betterment of society um and Allah, i can see your lips moving and what what, what do you think in that space well, uh, I think that um, there are, uh, first of all, you're, you're totally right to be skeptic. Skepticism is healthy. Um, I, don't, I do not see uh, the, the future as dystopian as, uh, as an Orwellian novel, uh, but uh, I agree with you that we should always keep our eyes open when it comes to deploying new technologies that can centralize and ease uh, surveillance. Um, you, could, uh, you could see uh, uh, examples of uh, uh, co collecting data that is anonymized, right? And that allows you to do the analytics you want to do and allows you to um, come up with the business intelligence that you want without actually attaching personal data to, uh, to, 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 to this, to whatever you're collecting, okay? Um, taking some examples, um, there is a Deutsche Telekom is uh, collecting the data uh, from uh, people uh, moving around uh, cities and selling them uh, to uh, companies who want to install bikes or e-scooters in different spots of the city. Yeah, On one hand, uh, this is a very valid economic model because now the bike rental or the scooter rental company can uh, know that at this particular time of the day, at this particular day of the week, these are the hot spots within the city that people will demand more and more scooters. So I will rent a spot here and put more and more scooters. But on the other hand, Deutsche Telekom is also uh, keeping the privacy of uh, this data that it's collecting. It is not selling to these scooter companies the fact that Daniel Norman is moving from here to here to here. What is selling to them is there are uh, 50,000 people in this part of the town between 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. Who are these people? What are their characteristics? It, it's all hidden. So yes, there are ways to uh, monetize data and build a data economy while at the same time keep it anonymized and conserve privacy. Okay, thank you. And, and Christian, what, what do you think in this space? Because I know you've got a Kind of a finance background as do i and i with the the ai driven platforms and smart cities my eyes kind of light up with opportunity but with my security hat on i just see a number of of opportunities for attackers to impact organizations and um, how do you how do you kind of balance that in terms of speaking to clients and speaking to to governments the nice part about this part of the world is you're you're ultimately typically the client ends up having some government connection so you're sitting there and they're saying I have a commitment to you know each country in the GCC and the MENA region has an AI policy for how they are using this data. You know we my company is a German AI company and, and there's no more restrictive. Uh, uh, country for privacy than Germany. So depending on where we're talking to a client, we're looking at their sovereign data rights and saying, how do we do this? So for example, you can use facial recognition in, uh, you know, in our neighborhood, but you can't use facial recognition in most of Europe, particularly in Germany. So as Ala As said, there are ways to count how many people are there and have it anonymized. Um, and not ever capture a pixel of somebody's face. So those are the two polarized, you know, ends that you see in the world where I have more concern is, you know, at home because, you know, as an American, um, we, you know, you see us on TV all the time. Like, you can't take away my rights. You can't make me do this. But Americans don't understand how much data we're giving away. We all pay $1,000 for an iPhone for it to stalk us. We'll download any app for it to stalk us. And we don't know that that information is being completely and 100% sold to someplace else. Every click on Facebook, you know, you know, Americans were shocked to find out that you can buy, you know, 
have foreign influence onto Facebook about elections and things like that. So because there is no policy, we don't really think about it at home and we don't use it for good. So for example, Chicago has a very, where I came from, has a very robust uh, gunshot detection program in gang areas, but it doesn't tie into the resources and the public doesn't know it's there. So we, we don't know where it's at. We don't know what it's supposed to be doing. And we are not uh, cognizant that our data is being sold. Whereas when my friends come to visit me in Dubai and they think, oh, this is highly monitored. You know, like, first of all, like I said in my last answer, if you don't like it, don't come. Like they tell you flat out, you know, most of these countries, you're on camera. I find that this is, gives me opportunities to do things that I would never do at night in downtown Chicago, like wander around by myself. So I can go out for a walk later and feel safe. So I know why the technology is there. The technology is, um, you know, I, I, I'm seeing front row when we're talking to the clients, it is protected. It is used for a very specific good. You know, you can't just, they don't turn around and tend to sell it to somebody else to look at it. It's, you know, I have this use case. I want to know what's going on here. Everything from, you know, I've sold things like I want to monitor where my dog is to where are my military resources. So you know it's there, you know why it's there, and you see the tied in benefit to your life of why. So is it moving the scooters around? Yes. Is it moving the buses around? Is it my, you know, my brother visited last month, blew his mind. He said, I've never seen so much security, but it's all friendly and welcoming. I'm not afraid of these people. I know that they're here to take care of me. And it's a friendly situation versus feeling like, you know, you're in a mall in America and you're like, why does that guy have a gun? So it's, um, I find that this part of the world is very much transparent on why it's happening and and the use cases are for making things better for people. So it doesn't it doesn't bother me. Okay, well said, perfectly well said. Let me just add then yeah, let just me just uh, punctuate what what Kristen said. I count my blessing every day for living in one of the safest cities in the world. Right. And I always remind myself and I always remind my friends that do not take this for granted. The fact that everyone I know in the UAE uh, uh, sleep with their doors unlocked, it's not something you can do anywhere else in the world. The fact that I would be 100% uh, sure and, and not worried if my uh, little sister is uh, walking down the street uh, at night in Dubai versus walking down the street at, at my home country. Uh, this is a testament that there are there is a huge effort happening behind the scene to, to secure these cities. Um, uh, using technology, but using also a lot of skills and a lot of hard work and blood and sweat and tears. So uh, I don't take this for granted. And one more thing in this one too, it's like you also as a provider of um, platforms, you know, what Allah and I do, you have a corporate responsibility to make sure that your values as a human being and as a company align with what you think is important. So I have never in two years been asked for use cases that would violate somebody's human rights or single somebody out for racial profiling or some other reason. But there are plenty of algorithms out there that do those types of things. So that's another thing you have to decide. You know, when my company has been asked, I've never been asked, but we have been asked globally to add in some use cases that we feel are morally um, not right for us or do not have the accuracy um, the accuracy of the algorithms to make them actually statistically valid and they would make people feel more violated or have so many false positives on um, what they're looking for in terms of racial demographics or ethnicity um, so you have to also take a moral stand and say you know we don't do this when asked and it doesn't happen very often but when it does you got to back away from that client fast but I've never seen it in, uh, in my region, which is thankful. I'm very thankful for that. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, I just wanna to pivot towards the, the smart city um, conversations. I think it leads quite nicely into that. Um, and what I've taken from, from both of your presentations here is we've got a broad spectrum of technologies um, underpinned by analytics, 5G, IoT, um, edge computing, 
from with my security hat on, I'm just seeing a huge, broad threat landscape um, with a number of opportunities for, for cyber attackers to, to compromise data, citizens, operations, finances. Um, whose responsibility is, is securing these devices, but also the city itself? And, and how can we and governments work together more cohesively to protect both citizens and organisations? And, and, and yeah, it's that? tough. I mean, my, my firm is not a cybersecurity expert, so we rely like on the clients and what they want to do. Yeah. And again, since most of them have some government tie in, it is interesting when you sell a new use case. So, for example, we had one in Abu Dhabi where they wanted these I mean, super cool 3D maps where they said, I want you know, it looks like real, you know, it looks like a photograph of the site. Um, but that requires tying into the MOI and the aviation, per, you know, like the permitting to get access to do that goes through the cybersecurity policies and you make sure that you have that. So in our case, on a platform level, they control the data. So we never host any data at all at, at my company. It is all going through wherever the client is hosting it. So it's not getting bounced off like it does the U.S. to someplace else. Whatever use case they have, whatever data they're collecting is going straight through. And we have central banks and geopolitical events as our clients, and they're super secure. So as long as, you know, what, letting us in to allow um, more and more use cases to functionally run a city does not minimize their cybersecurity protection. It actually adds in and helps them find a breach faster because you can start saying there's data spikes on the platform. You can use the platform to start running different things. So from our side, it has really been a, you know, like a, I don't want to say a non-event, it's something we think about, but it's not something that um, adding more use cases doesn't make it less secure. Okay. And yeah, right. I, I'm like, what, what do you think there as well? Because I'm, I'm conscious we, we covered 5G in one of our future threat forecasts a few years back. And what it boiled down to was the increased bandwidth would just essentially increase the speed and scale of potential cyber attacks. Um, what, what do you think in that space, Alan? I'm underpinning that as well. I think of IoT and I think billions of devices already embedded, they're typically insecure. A lot of them have been built without an ability to update or patch them. Um, it, it just sends alarms off in my head in, in terms of security. So what, what do you think? Yes, the, definitely uh, the new technologies are uh, expanding the attack factor, right? Um, but uh, if we want to uh, first uh, divide this problem into three categories, you have cybersecurity on the IT uh, systems, cybersecurity on the OT systems, and then the newer one is cybersecurity on the IoT systems. Uh, the one that is most uh, advanced because uh, the world has been thinking about this problem for the past 50 years is cybersecurity on the IT side. And here we have pretty much uh, figured out a lot of uh, protocols, a lot of technologies, a lot of uh, uh, encryption mechanisms and, and hashing mechanisms um, and, and scanning mechanisms to be able to secure all three layers of an IT infrastructure, from the from the network security to the platform security to the application security itself. Uh, when we moved to start thinking about OT security, things became more challenging because here uh, the you're not only attacking uh, a server in, in a bank or a server in, in a company and stealing data or locking data. Now you, well, with OT, uh, you could uh, freeze uh, the, uh, the, the electricity grid of a city, or you could attack a critical infrastructure or, or, or a nuclear uh, power station. So suddenly the, the risk is much more than data leak or data breach or, or privacy. And we have seen a lot of, uh, again, uh, specialized focus on OT security. And you will find a lot of uh, players uh, on the software level and on the hardware level uh, covering this from chip all the way up to, to cloud. 
uh, I would uh, still think it still has a little bit to go to catch up with IT security. And then the third and currently most exposed uh, attack vector is, is IoT. Uh, when you see all the cyber security professionals focusing on securing servers and data centers and now power substations and electricity grids and critical infrastructure, uh, you will find very few of them focusing on securing your smart thermostat at home from which a hacker could enter or your smart TV that is 99% of people in the world using a password of 000111, right? Uh, hackers are having a field day penetrating uh, companies and uh, homes using IoT devices, and it gets uh, more dangerous when we're talking about IIoT, industrial IoT devices. So this is the most emerging uh, domain of, of cybersecurity. There are some uh, advances and some technologies and protocols that are taking place, whether on the cellular security side, uh, talking about people like uh, Gemalto or people like JNK, or uh, uh, on the on the uh, unlicensed, non-cellular IoT part like LoRa and the other players. Uh, it's interesting to watch this uh, domain and, and how it grows. But currently, yes, this is the most exposed out of the three. Okay, interesting. Um, Kristen, in, in your presentation, you mentioned, um, and I really like this sort of definition of AI as being a breeding ground for value driving business models. Um, I like the idea of the model that you have with um, sort of managing a fast paced, scalable um, model um, using neural networks in a safe, manageable way. Um, my one question that I had was, when you talk about the overarching data management layer, um, or the, I guess you call it the ivory tower piece. Whose responsibility is security? Uh, we've touched on it briefly, but the way in which I looked at, say, the, the, the case studies that you gave there, if we took the smart wall case study and we had a range of different connected devices, systems, but you've got the perspective of all of that, um, whose responsibility is security? Is it, is it still the individual component elements and I'm thinking more along the lines of supply chain risk. How, how do you manage supply chain security when the, the, the spectrum of, of, uh, of organizations and systems and networks connected is, is so complex? You have to have a partnership with, you know, not just, we don't do any hardware. So we're dependent on making sure that whatever is on that system is talking to us and it has to talk to us in line with the client's security parameters. So one of the things like, for example, in Europe, we do almost all of our cases, we're able to install and maintain them remotely. In the GCC, everybody says, no, 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 you got to come over here. It's on prem. It's not going in a cloud and there will be nothing leaving our system because we're eventually tied to, you know, they're all treated as critical sites due to the government structure. So we end up having a, a kind of a mix. So, you know, any use case that the client wants from a provider standpoint is obviously vetted by us where we'll say, um, you know, we, we have experience with this or we don't. So for example, there's a um, myriad list of facial recognition algorithms and you can say, what are you using them for? So if you're looking to defend a critical site, you must have a very, very high tolerance and confidence of the security of who's coming in and the matching up of who it is. Whereas if you're in a retail situation and you say, I just want to recognize my top, top, top spenders, but if I've got 50% confidence that that's, you know, Dan walking in, then that's okay for them. And then that goes down to their, if it's a corporation, their data privacy standards. If it is a government, their, their privacy standards. But we all work with the client always has a very strong relationship with at least one systems integrator that provides their hardware for them, that they trust to say, I need you to maintain this. I need you to inventory this. I need you to check this. We can put that information into our system and say, something's weird. Like this number of cameras are offline or this many people haven't showed up or you know, this many people are not turning on their app to give them a flavor of something's, something's up. But ultimately the, the responsibility for the system is with the client. Um, and they have, 
you wouldn't believe the amount of rules that they have in this part of the world for how how's the data coming in, where's it going, who gets to see it, when do we take action, you know, the the admin rights delineated, like, you know, if you have a smart city, the um, admin rights for the person running the little coffee shop that they're trying to do the loyalty program are much different than the, the security manager for physical security of the entire thing. So at every role, at every input, at every API, there are security protocols coming in and they're defined both by the client as well as us as a platform. If we say, listen, our experience on that vendor or that algorithm has been, it doesn't work on the tolerance that you are paying us to do. So do we layer in, do we create a custom algorithm for you to blend multiple ones to get your security tolerance? Or do you say we want a different vendor? So it's always a partnership between the client, the systems integrator and, and the software providers. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, when, when, when you say at every point, at every junction, at every API, uh, this, is, this is exactly the, the, the right approach because the most security threats happen at the junctions, at the uh, inter... Uh, so I like to compare this to uh, the cold chain uh, management. When you are transporting uh, frozen food or when you are transporting medication, from point A to point B, you have 10 points along the road where uh, they are being transitioned either manually or automatically from uh, the warehouse, the back of the truck, from the back of the truck to the next offloading point, from the offloading point to the ship, from the ship. Um, and uh, this, a, a cold chain solution should always be uninterrupted. The key word here is uninterrupted. And if you fail in one of these junctions, then the entire end-to-end -end goal of keeping your food frozen fails. This, is, uh, this metaphor works very well with security. Security should be end-to-end -end and un uninterrupted chain of security and this chain is as secure as its weakest link and the biggest threats always happen at the junctions whether it's an api's software junction or whether it's a physical junction so back to your question daniel whose responsibility is it well it's a collective responsibility you have to have uh, a guidance uh, uh, protocols, standards that guide the end-to-end -end security, but then every player around along a supply chain, whether he's, he's securing the, the data or they're securing the goods being transported, it's his responsibility from point A to point B, and then another guy from point B to point C or another entity, and then C to D, and overall, uh, the chain must be uninterrupted. And it needs to be like completely self-learning. So for example, using the, the, the cold food example, we have a, a client, Lidl, that you know they have a great situation to make sure the food gets where it needs to go safely and is ready for us to all come in and, and buy frozen stuff. Um, you know who was messing this up was the client, were the shoppers, because they would leave the door open and they would open the door and look at the stuff and then they would walk away like we all do in the store. Um, I need to get better versed. I don't remember if it was 8 million euro per month or per quarter that they were losing on food and um, uh, uh, utility costs because people leave a little door shut. So we wrote an algorithm for them and put a sensor on there. So, you know, like, is the door open? And, you know, how fast can you get over and shut the door? And has the temperature ever hit there? Because until we did this for them, they just had to throw away freezers worth of food because, they didn't know. So from, you know, a farm to the store, everything was super secure until the end user, the, you know, the, the, the shopper messes it up for them. So, you know, you learn and you learn your system learns what, where the, the link is so you can go in and fix it. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you for that. I think I probably had a misconception um, coming from a, a European background that um, the Middle East was perhaps a, a technological wild west if that makes sense and um i think the reality is it's a state-led strategy for innovation but underpinned by really strong protocols standards and, and regulations that can support that growth in a in a secure way so it's sort of the perfect breeding ground for for organizations that want to go there and 
and yeah, monetize data, but also do it in a, in a secure and safe way. Um, I am conscious of the time. I would, I, I'm confident we could chat for, for hours and hours about these uh, subtopics. But um, to to kind of summarize, I'd like I'd like you both to to give your opinions on on where we're going with this with this topic in terms of technology and technological innovation and development in the Middle East. And I'll start with Allah. What what do we have in store for the next three to five years, especially in the Middle East, in terms of tech development and smart cities and and adoption? What are your thoughts? So I'm very bullish about uh, GCC, and I'm I'm very bullish about this part of the world uh, for the reasons uh, you mentioned, uh, which is uh, there's a, a, a state uh, leaders that are big believers in the digital economy, big believers in uh, technology, uh, big believers in talent, big believers in data. Uh, but I would also add to your point that uh, they are very well uh, appreciative of the um, private sector and the innovators in the private sector. They do understand that uh, they they need to learn from the market and they do ask a lot of questions and they do learn a lot we're always in in touch with multiple uh, regulatory authority whether those uh, do dealing with uh, ai or those dealing with regulating uh, crypto and blockchain or those dealing with regulating uh, big data and you will always uh, see uh, and feel when you when you when you uh, sit with them that uh, they on one hand they are very intelligent and very knowledgeable but on the other hand they are very open to listen and learn and this blend of attracting uh, talents from the private sector and uh, very uh, open minded and uh, technology oriented and progressive minded state is what will make the economies of this region uh, very, very competitive. I would say uh, uh, top ten in the next decade. Uh, but I'd also like to to come back uh, to one of the points that Kristen mentioned. So in her slide, she used the terms the age of platforms, and I think this is very accurate to uh, the age we're living in right now and uh, what is going to happen in the next five or 10 years. Historically, every time a point solution went against a platform, the point solution wins on the short term, the platform always, always wins on the long term. So whether you're looking at an IoT platform, whether you're looking at an AI platform, uh, the fact that you have a horizontal platform that enables multiple applications and enables you to skin a lot of applications on top of it. This is uh, definitely uh, the, the future and definitely the winning solution on the long term. And when I speak to um, state decision makers or to uh, private sector decision makers, I'm clearly seeing this shift in focus from trying to fix a problem today that they have today to a longer term thinking, how do I install a solution that can help me solve multiple problems of the same type in the next five or 10 years? And the answer for this is almost always invariably a, a platform. Okay, thank you, Allah. And Christian, any, any additional um, thoughts for the next three to five years? Yeah, I think that like, you know, everybody talks about sustainability. So, you know, I'm in Doha today and everybody's, you know, everybody in our industry is FIFA, 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 FIFA. But when you talk to the rulers of this country, uh, which I've had the privilege to do multiple times, they say, don't, you know, help us with FIFA, but be thinking how whatever we're going to do is going to have scalable impact to our citizens beyond, you know, a sporting event. The sporting event is marketing for tourism, but what we really need to do is back that up with, you know, a, um, a, a country that is well run and that we're committed to showing that we're building the future, similar to, you know, there's a lot of focus on 
you know, our home of Dubai, because Dubai visibly, I mean, went from the sand to Dubai in 50 years. It's absolutely incredible, the adherence to a vision and embracing of technology and help from people from outside. And we're seeing the rest of the GCC do that on their own terms. Doha does not want to be Dubai, be Dubai but Doha has a vision of what they want to do. Neom has a vision of what they want to do. And they're committed to bringing in the best help that they know will uh, help them achieve that. Um, what's really cool is you said you imagine this part to be the Wild West. It turns out America is still the Wild West because you know uh, we innovate a lot of these technology solutions and we look at them and say, "Wow, this is possible, and I can monetize it." So coming from you know an asset management background, I have huge respect for that. But we don't take those companies don't have governance governance on how they're going to do it. This part of the world at least says, I'm listening. I want to see every treat you can bring me. What does the future look like? Things from like, um, you know, in Neom, they want everybody within five minutes uh, cradle to grave to have health care. So we get questions of in five years, how are you going to deliver medications to people that we know are going to have them? Here are the uh, genetic diseases that we know are endemic to the GCC. How do we plan our healthcare systems so that we are ready to take care of people and that we um, improve and elongate life based on like, we, we gotta change these things. How do we, uh, you know, there's that tomato farmer in Dubai who makes this awesome cherry tomatoes underground in the desert. So the agritech is coming in. So, you know, first it was security, then it's retail. Then it is how do we bring all these things that we're importing in the world, how do we get them here in a tiny space and make them better? So it's really, you know, super cool. I'm, you know, I'm an American kid, so I'm used to watching the Jetsons and, you know, I get to live in the Jetsons every day. You know, I just wish someone would come and do my hair. That's the next thing. Uh, but the vision and the commitment and the ability to pull it off is like super cool. So, you know, I don't know what they're going to do in the next I know what they're going to do in the next three to five years, but the, the imagination for the next 10 to 15, I want to see it. I want a front row seat and we have and, one. And the right incentives, the right incentives. Technology is never meaningful if it's only deployed for the sake of technology. And yeah. a smart city should not be a showcase of tacky, gadgety technology. It should be empowered by meaningful technologies. And Kristen, you just mentioned two super important points. I would add a third point. You mentioned sustainability, and then you mentioned healthcare. Basically, you're talking about one of two or three pillars why smart technology should ever be considered in a smart city. Number one, uh, happiness. Citizen lifestyle and happiness, increasing the quality of life of people living in a smart city. Number two, uh, the environment, reducing the human impact, whether it's our carbon footprint, where, whether it's our total ecological footprint of the environment, we should use technology for that. And third, it's for business. It's for uh, finding technology that makes sense for the private sector and for the public sector to either generate revenues or to reduce expenses by improving operational efficiencies. So any technology uh, to be implemented in a smart city should pass one of three, these three filters or at least meet two or three or all three. Is it being deployed to enhance the happiness of citizens? Is it being deployed to decrease our environmental impact and make us more friendly? Or is it being deployed to generate uh, a more uh, business? And I uh, can assure you that everybody I talk to in this part of the world, whether on the state leadership or on the uh, private sector leadership, understand this. And that's why the correct incentives are in place. And that's why I have a uh, bullish position and very optimistic about the future of technology in this part of the world. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that summary as well, both. Really enjoyed the, uh, the presentations, but yeah, really enjoyed the, um, the questions as well. So it's been a pleasure sharing the, uh, the webinar with you both. Um, I think we are out of time. So I would definitely like to thank everyone for, for joining and for some of the questions that filtered through in the Q&A box. Um, but I believe I have to pass back over to Khalid to, to wrap up the, uh, the webinar today. So Khalid, if you could uh, come back on camera um, and yeah, 
say goodbye to, to all of these lovely people on the line. That was an interesting uh, webinar. Uh, too many questions, and I would like to thank everyone here for the for being patient and receiving all these questions and being able to answer them. So thank you very much, uh, guys. And uh, I hope I'll see you all soon uh, in a different topic, uh, different timing, in a, with a good weather, hopefully, not in the hot weather that we have. Uh, thank you all. And thank you to all the people behind the scene who made this happen. Thank you, Khalid. Thank you, Khadija. Thank you, Dan and Ryan. Thank you, SPA, Sierra, and Security Middle East. Yeah, I echo that. Thank you very much for this opportunity. It's, it's a privilege and gift to get to talk to all of you and to have a robust conversation about what's going on and how to create the future. So very much thank you for including us.